Can I tell you a story about a sleepless night? It's March 2024, about three in the morning, and I'm lying there awake. By four, I finally get up and start scrolling through Facebook. I know, don't tell my mom. If she were here, she'd say I should be doing something more healthy, like jumping on a mini trampoline or juicing some celery. Not Facebook, not at four in the morning, not good for your eyes. Anyway, I'm on Facebook and I find this joke. One of our neighbors had a duck that became headless. He didn't duck fast enough. This is just the kind of silly joke that my family likes. A play on words that makes you groan. The owner of this post is my cousin Carol. I'm looking at her Facebook page on the morning of her 74th birthday. She didn't post this today, though. I don't think she posts anything anymore. Carol Ann was named after my mother, Shirley Ann. She's my first cousin, but her family lived two miles from us, and we were in and out of each other's houses and lives, so more like siblings than cousins. Carol's in the last stages of Parkinson's disease. At Christmas time, her daughter, Carrie Ann, called me and said, you need to plan a trip now while she still remembers you because the hallucinations are worse, dementia has set in, she's not eating well, she's lost a lot of weight. So that's what I'm doing at four in the morning on Facebook on March 14th. I can't sleep because I'm thinking about Carol on her birthday. And if I'm being honest, it's one of a series of sleepless nights. Why am I having so much trouble? Hey, Mama. Hey, baby. How you doing? If you're my age, you've lost classmates and parents and neighbors by now. So you know that over time, we develop an internal process to handle these things, even though it never becomes easy. Is this the picture you were talking about with this hat? Yeah, that hat she gave me at her house. I remember I loved it, and, she, and I wore that thing all the time. A few years ago, we all said goodbye to Cousin Ron. And when Carol called him, she just burst into tears. And pretty soon he said, so is this Carol? Are you just crying right now? Ron ended up comforting Carol from his deathbed, but I think her crying comforted him too. As adults, they didn't see each other all that often, mostly at reunions and funerals. But she didn't want to lose him, and maybe that's just the way it is with cousins. Even when we aren't close, we don't want to let each other go, because when we do, we lose another piece of our childhood. In this case, I think it's way more than that for me. I'm not the pushy type of relative who tries to dictate next steps from afar or insist on daily updates. But in my heart, I'm holding on too tight, and I'm not sure why. I need to loosen my grip if I'm going to let her go, but I'm not sure how. So I'm going to sift through the memories, whether they are funny or sad or happy or irreverent, and just see what I can figure out. Hey, Mom. I'm just calling to see if you had Carol's number. Yeah, I do. I'll send it to you. My kids always loved to visit Carol. I think she made them feel special. What's your favorite Carol memory? Then she used to make that really good grape juice. And she made us uh, sham burgers that I thought were going to be so gross, but they were so good. And I think about them all the time. One weekend, we were at her place in Gresham, Oregon, and I saw this bottle of vodka on her counter. No, it wasn't vodka. It was that really high octane stuff like the college kids put punch back in the day. I think it's called Everclear. And beside it was a spray bottle and a gallon of distilled water. And I was like, Carol, when did you start drinking? Do you put this in your homemade grape juice? And she went, oh, no, 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 no. I don't drink it. But Nance, you've got to get yourself some of this. It will change your life. Carol explained that the liquor store was up the road and around the corner. You go in there, and the nice man at the counter will help you find the Everclear. Mix an ounce with distilled water and spray down your countertops every day. This will kill all the hidden germs you didn't even know you had, and your family won't get sick anymore. It's 6 a.m. now. Time for me to put my memories away for a while and get ready for work. I'm feeling better, though, because I'm picturing Carol with that look in her eyes, and I'm thinking what it would have been like if Mom had been with us there that day. Aunt Shirley, 
Come with me to the liquor store. I'm going to show you just what to buy. You notice the name Anne repeats a lot in my story. The youngest is Chloe Ann. That's my granddaughter. She's not quite two. The oldest? We don't even know. Go back to church records in Norway and search for yourself. But in our family memory, the matriarch is great-grandma Anna Moon. She was a stern figure who came to Wisconsin and married great-grandpa back in the Gilded Age. They moved to a sheep ranch in South Dakota where they lived happily ever after. Just kidding. Anna hated the sheep ranch. But great-grandpa was restless. He liked to move around. And Carol Ann used to be restless, too. It always seemed like she was searching for something she couldn't find. We used to go thrift shopping with her all the time for, like, Pyrex dishes and stuff. Oh, yeah. She loved her Pyrex dishes at the thrift store. (laughs) But I thought it was fun to go thrift shopping with her. She looked for health cures, scoured thrift stores, changed husbands. Sometimes this restless activity caused tension in the family. It put a strain on relationships. But then, these last few years, it seems like she found what she was looking for. My grandfather told me this story. He said that when he was nine, he was whittling a piece of wood with his brand new pocket knife. He slipped and cut his leg Great-grandma didn't rush to his aid or get him a bandage. Instead, she grabbed a switch and beat him for cutting a hole in his pants that she would have to mend. At the ranch in South Dakota, when a neighbor brought a plate full of fresh donuts, Anna Moon had her children return it, saying, I make my own donuts. These are the family stories. To be fair, it seems the ranch was not a financial success, and Anna had to sell her prize piano to make ends meet. So. She had a reason to be unhappy sometimes, but I guarantee if the neighbor lady brought Carol Ann a plateful of donuts, Carol would extend an invitation to her germ-free kitchen, pour a glass of milk, and proceed to make that neighbor feel special. So, Jody, what is this hairstyle called? Well, I love it. I would say since it's from the 60s, it's probably very Vidal Sassoon inspired, because that's around the time that Vidal was doing like kind of his short little pixies that had a lot of volume. The year I was nine, my aunt and uncle moved to a place that didn't have a good high school. Carol attended boarding school and came to our house on the weekends. Her brothers both lived in my room that year, and I slept on the couch. I thought this was grand. It was a strange year in the news. Assassinations, riots. Richard Nixon got elected president, Apollo 8 orbited the moon, and Carol bought me a manicure set, she taught me how to shave my legs, and she found the very best ways to make piano practice more fun. She would point at a passage and say, just pretend we have reindeer prancing throughout this entire section. I like to watch her tease and spray until her hair could stay pristine through a hurricane. She told me that when I was a baby, I used to stand on her lap and chew on her hair, and I got to thinking, yikes, I hope she didn't use this much hairspray back then. When Carol was quite young, she got a hold of her mom's sewing scissors and played hairdresser right before camp meeting. Her older sister explains, procedure, take younger brother with you under the table. Place scissors, blades flat against forehead, start snipping, and continue up and over the head. Same procedure for brother. My aunt was not thrilled with this situation, but I'm guessing Carol thought she was making a new style. You know, would you say she was pretty stylish? Oh, for sure. I mean, look at the outfit, the hair, for sure. That summer, she put a lawn chair out back and wore a bikini to sunbathe. My dad, he was an old-fashioned guy, so if he accidentally glanced that direction, he would look away and say, Oh, of all things. My mom would shush him. Now, Bill, that's what the girls all wear to the beach these days. A few days after Carol's birthday, I'm talking back and forth with her sisters. Her older sister shows us a photo of the beautiful lap quilt she made for Carol, who just loves it. And as we say goodbye to Carol, more friends and family will share their memories. And it occurs to me that each unique set of memories will be like a quilt block in a beautiful patchwork. 
our memory collection. And I first learned about writing down memories when I was 12 after a family accident. I lived a sheltered life, and it was my first family shock. First funeral, first time seeing everybody around me behave mechanically, as if they didn't know what to do next. And I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. Nobody was advising me, so I relied on what I had read in books, which was that people write family facts in the family Bible. I found this really big Bible that had an empty page, and I recorded the details of this accident right there in my childish hand. And being a kid, I didn't hide behind euphemisms. My description was vivid and raw. Later, I heard my mom say to my aunt, I wish she hadn't done that. And my aunt answered, oh, leave her be, Cheryl. She needs a place to work this out. In these situations, kids can get lost in the shuffle. Now, it's not on purpose, but if you're a parent in grief, you might not have any bandwidth left for the 12-year-old. We got to the church for the funeral, and Carol appeared at my side. The 21-year-old and the 12-year-old sat together up front. In the second pew on the right, she kept her arm around me the entire time. She had a pile of tissue. Whenever I looked up at her, she was looking down at me. She stayed with me in the car and at the graveside. On a day when I felt lost and alone, Carol found me. This doesn't surface until I've been sorting through my Carol memories for several days. You know, some memories are right on the top of the pile. They're fun, ever clear. I review them often. Veggie burgers. Others are not as pleasant. Funerals. It takes longer to find them. But this one is key. Carol and I were close when I chewed on our hair when our families were in and out of each other's houses for Saturday night games and Christmas events. And that time her future first husband carried me on his shoulders while we went for ice cream at camp meeting. And we were close at her wedding and when I felt her babies kick before they were born. We were more distant when we moved further apart and she switched husbands and I wasn't sure what she was up to. And then close again when I moved back and she took me to thrift stores and fed my kids. And distant when she got restless again and then close once more after that. But always at all times, no matter what, we have been inextricably linked because of those few hours in the church and the car and the graveyard on that day in October of 1971. And that's why I'm holding on so tight. That's why it's so hard to let go. I asked her daughter if she knows what Carol was looking for when she was so restless, because it really does seem like she found it. I was trying to figure out what the story of her life might be. Was it a quest? A coming-of-age story? Her daughter thought maybe Carol had expectations of a fairy tale life in her head. Perfect health, a perfect marriage, and at some point that changed. All seems to have to do with expectations. I think great-grandma Anna Moon had unfulfilled expectations. She expected her nine-year-old son to keep his clothing in perfect condition. She expected to take care of her family 100% with no outside assistance. By all accounts, she died a bitter woman. It seems like Anna's story was not complete, and I'm feeling some compassion for her that I never felt before. A while back, we held a prayer vigil for Carol, hoping for healing, but I don't think that will happen. And yet, do we know what true healing is? It seems like Carol took stock and realized that all the things she really wanted, she already had. A wonderful husband, loving children, amazing grandsons, and a really friendly cat. She reached out and repaired frayed relationships from her restless years. She replaced her expectations with gratitude, appreciation, a love of life. And isn't this a form of healing? So I think Carol Ann found what Anna Moon did not. And because she did, perhaps I can loosen my grip now and let her go. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
In the future, what will I tell granddaughter Chloe Ann about her name? First and foremost, she is one of a kind. She is also a joyful, creative lover of music like so many Anns before her. When she needs to stand up for herself to be a fierce Viking, she can think of Anna Moon. When she wants to take care of her health or be stylish, she can think of Carol Ann. But please, no ever clear and no cutting her own hair. When I visited in January, Carol still knew who I was. She met Chloe Ann on video chat. We also made a video for Cousin Ron's sister. Hey, I finally grew up and put on a bra. Girl humor? But in a way, isn't that what we all do in this life? We strive to grow up. So maybe Carol's life is a coming-of-age story, but... I'm going to think of it as a comeback story because over and over throughout the years, Carol Ann has always come back to me. Your turn. <laughs> My turn. I'm still waiting for the chance to do a family reunion, but it's going to take a while now. <laughs> Love you.